So we, we human beings are naturally disposed to believe of ourselves and of others that we are free, that what we do is often and to a considerable extent up to us via the exercise of a power of choice to do or to refrain from doing one or more alternatives of which we are aware. In what follows, I will probe the source uh, and epistemic justification of our freedom belief and propose an account that does not lean heavily on our first personal experience of choice and action. I will then consider possible replies available to incompatibilists, those who believe that uh, freedom and determinism, causal determinism, are incompatible, uh, to the contention made by some compatibilists that the privileged epistemic status of freedom belief, which my account endorses, supports a minimalist and therefore compatibilist view of the nature of freedom itself. All right, so I start from the large but widely shared assumption that our belief in agential freedom, free will, in mature human beings is somehow or other properly basic, that is, rationally warranted, independent of any evidential connection to other warranted beliefs. My aim is merely to determine the most plausible account of how this is so. A common view among philosophers, past and present, is that our belief in freedom is based in an experience as of freedom that pervades deliberate choice and action. If this view is correct, we may readily propose an analogy with beliefs that have their immediate source in sensory experience. It is widely held that, for example, my sensory-based belief that I am sitting in a chair when I was composing this talk or that I am now standing is non-inferentially rationally warranted, despite both its being conceivable that I am dreaming and the fact that I and the fact that my perceiving a chair, you are sitting in a chair, my perceiving a chair as a chair depends causally on my having had prior experiences and conceptual learning, learning the concept of a chair. The doxastic deliverances of sensory experience, or many of them, are epistemically innocent until proven guilty. Likewise, it may be claimed, for our belief in our own freedom, grounded in an experience as of freedom. To assess this proposal, we need to consider the content of our experiences as of freedom. Psychologists have suggested that the background focal distinction that is apt for describing sensory awareness also applies to awareness of our own agency. When I walk to campus along the usual route, I am often thinking about the lecture I'm about to give. I barely attend to my stopping at the traffic light or my continuous action when not so stopped of moving my legs. Nonetheless, I have a background sense of being in control of what I am doing. It is difficult to characterize precisely this background sense of agency, though I will return to it below. What most philosophers have in mind when ex appealing to experience as grounding warranted freedom belief is not this background sense of agency, but instead a more focal and episodic experience. The experience we have when consciously and more or less deliberately deciding what we shall do when confronted with a limited number of action alternatives. In such cases, it seems to, to me that it is in my power to determine the choice I'm about to make. At a minimum, a power to do or not to do some contemplated action. It is not sufficiently appreciated, however, that an experience-based account of the epistemic warrant of freedom belief must make several tacit empirical commitments. The most obvious of these is that the experience as of freedom is a cross-cultural universal, rather than being limited to those who have been reared in particular cultural ways of thinking about agency and responsibility. There is some evidence in support of the universality of freedom experience, but it remains to be firmly established. 
A second empirical commitment is that such experience, even if universal, is the basis of freedom belief, rather than the other way around, and that it is also not substantially shaped by any other explanatorily prior belief, such as a belief in moral responsibility. Against this, one might point to evidence that the degree of control one ascribes to oneself can be modulated to some degree by external cues. However, such studies are limited, for feasibility reasons, to post-choice reports, rather than targeting real-time experience in willing, and so provide direct evidence only for the malleability of post hoc beliefs, that is, beliefs after the fact about what, what we were previously experiencing. A third assumption that this epistemic account appears to require is that the experience as of freedom is appropriately causally related to the process of choice and action. Sensory experience is a reliable causal consequence of, of the physical reality perceived, right? My sensory experience of you sitting there in chair, in a chair, is a, uh, a causal consequence of the fact of your sitting in the chair. Likewise, it seems, the experience of freedom, if it is to ground the justification of freedom belief, should be reliably and fairly directly caused by, if it is not simply an aspect of, the formation of choice, the manifestation of the, the multivalent power seemingly experienced. Some see evidence to the contrary in certain abnormal uh, clinical phenomena, such as anarchic and alien hand syndromes, in which an individual engages in purposive behavior, for, for example, reaching for someone else's water glass, while lacking the experience as of controlling or even desiring the behavior. The conclusion drawn is that the causal pathway of the experience as of freedom is quite distinct from the origin of purposive decision itself. And so such experience, when present, should not be taken to be a plausible epistemic basis for justified belief concerning the nature of purposive action itself. Note, however, that this establishes only that purposive action can occur without freedom experience. And we already knew that. Purposive action is a broader category than directly free action, encompassing the significant portion of our behavior that is automated, including the routine behavior that I noted a moment ago of taking a familiar route to work each day. Usually, such purposive behavior is also accompanied by a background sense of agency, and that is what is missing in these clinical ca cases, much to the uh, people's considerable distress. But neither the, the diffuse background sense of agency nor the unconsciously generated and regulated behavior it normally accompanies are at issue here. The theoretical commitment of the epistemic view that we are exploring is that deliberate conscious choices very reliably either cause or have as a component an experience as of freedom in so choosing. The unusual cases that I cited simply do not speak to this claim. And even if cases could be adduced that prize apart these elements, Unless there was reason to suppose that they do so with some frequency, they would not provide a compelling basis against the epistemological position that, as with the counterpart uh, epistemological position regarding sensory experience, requires only substantial, not perfect, reliability in the connection between experience and its object. A fourth and final empirical commitment of an experience-based account of warranted freedom belief stems from the fact that each of us has first personal experience only of our own agency, and yet, unlike sensory experience, we would seem to have warranted belief in the freedom of others, too. This suggests the need for a two-part account 
on which belief in my own freedom is epistemically basic, while my belief in others' freedom is implicitly inferred from my beliefs that others are relevantly similar to me, including in their having experience as of freedom similar to my own. The latter clause commit one, commits one to a substantial empirical claim about the source of a belief. I do not see evidence that any of the four empirical assumptions has been significantly disconfirmed to date, but they are non-trivial assumptions that are much less evident than the corresponding assumptions we make regarding our own sensory experience. For this reason, it is desirable to have an account of the warrant of freedom belief that does not depend on these assumptions. Such an alternative account is ready to hand. Rather than drawing an analogy with belief in sensory experience, we may draw one with our foundational empirical belief in a regular causal order to physical reality. This is a belief that we bring to our experience and exploration of that reality that serves as an unargued starting point for our, for our investigations of that reality. Our belief in freedom, we may plausibly contend, is a starting point in our, inter in our approach to social reality. Whatever the evolutionary etiology, we are primed to see ourselves and our fellows as agents with a substantial measure of freedom of choice, which partly grounds our moral responsibility. This belief need not be grounded in an experience as of freedom to have a privileged epistemic status, though it plausibly is at least buttressed by such experience. That said, an account on which freedom belief occurs and is warranted independently of freedom experience in incurs an empirical commitment no less than an account on which there is a dependence. It is safer, therefore, to, re to retreat to endorsing the disjunction of the two accounts, with the choice between them to be resolved, if it can, on empirical grounds. All right, second part of the talk, justified freedom belief and risky theories of freedom. Incompatibilists are those who hold that the falsity of causal determinism is a necessary condition on our being free. Some compatibilists have argued that only a successful final physical theory with this implication could give us reason to believe that this condition is satisfied. Only a physical theory uh, could give us reason to believe that causal determinism is false. As the jury is still out on what a final physics will imply, we ought to be agnostic about whether our behavior is determined. This is so the argument goes. But since we are entitled to believe that we are free, we have reason to think that compatibilism is true, since its truth, unlike that of libertarianism, the conjunction of incompatibilism and the thesis that we are free, is independent of this still open question. Put another way, libertarianism has implications for physics and neuroscience the science most directly germane to the etiology of human action. But we have no business believing in advance of the science that the best final theories in these domains will have non-deterministic dynamics. That's the argument. I will now consider and criticize a couple replies that libertarians have made to this argument and then propose and endorse a third reply. So first response is that compatibilism has scientifically risky commitments too. So compatibilism's in the same boat. All right, libertarian accounts of direct freedom differ, but they often have the form of endorsing many conditions commonly recognized by compatibilists and then adding, at minimum, a condition of significant causal indeterminism. Therefore, let us concede, we, we could quibble with that, but let us concede that compatibilist accounts of freedom require less than libertarian accounts. The first response contends that it is not only distinctively incompatibilist conditions on freedom that seem potentially falsifiable by future science. In fact, recent studies in cognitive and social psychology 
have been claimed to show that human agents are badly ill-informed about their own motivations for acting as they do, and furthermore, that their experience as of consciously willing to act as they do is neither an aspect of nor caused by the actual unconscious processes that generate their behavior. Admittedly, the arguments made from such studies are overblown, or so it seems to me. But, says the first respondent, the very fact that competent and knowledgeable theorists wish to debate these claims shows that they are not scientifically innocent. Libertarians may be hostage to views in future physics, but insofar as many compatibilists endorse conditions on freedom that these recent contentions have put on the table, they are hostage to views in future psychology. However, I think the compatibilist has a reply here that is not available to the libertarian. For it is hard to see how science could consistently deny the efficacy of our conscious wills as a general matter. Scientific theories, models, and results are themselves the products of scientific activity, of human persons acting in certain coordinated, purposive ways and communicating their activities and results to one another, while the reality of reliably known purposive action may not be an explicit premise or part of the theoretical content of scientific theories. It is a pragmatic assumption of such science. If we supposed it to be false, we would thereby have reason to doubt the trustworthiness of the outputs of such activities. It is reasonable to accept the trustworthiness of these outputs only insofar as we take them to have resulted from actions guided by the specific conscious purposes and beliefs that the actors report them to have met. To deny the efficacy of conscious will is to saw off the branch on which one sits. One certainly may argue unproblematically that human action and self-awareness are prone to error and ignorance in a variety of specific forms. Our grasp of our own motivations is imperfect. We are sometimes self-deceived, and it is not always easy to come to a more accurate self-understanding, even when we learn of the flaws in our cognitive design. By contrast, willusionism, the view that the experience of efficacious conscious willing is a pervasive of is inherently unstable because of its sweeping generality, as it thereby encompasses the very activity of the would-be unmasters of human agency. This simple point is not sufficiently appreciated by some no-free-will scientists who precisely target at times the assumption of simply of conscious, uh, conscious efficacious agency which they do not clearly distinguish from freedom as libertarians understand it. All right, second response to the uh, argument that um, privilege epistemic, and the privilege epistemic status of freedom belief uh, suggests that we should have a minimalist and therefore compatibilist view of freedom. Um, and that response is to hedge say that one need uh, hedge one's bets only on incompatibilism, not on freedom. And let, now, now I'll explain. So Peter von Inlogen, in his, his famous book and essay on free will back in 1983, uh, reports that his various a priori commitments in the matter of free will and moral responsibility are of variable strength. He has several commitments, and he does not hold them all equally strongly. In particular, his confidence in we are morally responsible creatures is greater than it is in we have free will, which is greater in turn than it is in incompatibilism is true and some of our acts are causally undetermined. This leads him to suggest that if determinism were empirically established, he would abandon his incompatibilism leaving intact his other stronger commitments. In reply to the compatibilist charge that his incompatibilism renders his beliefs concerning moral responsibility and freedom hostage to physics, he in effect says that only his incompatibilism is so hostage. 
not his commitment to the reality of responsibility and freedom. Let us consider Ben Edwagen's stance more carefully in order to determine whether it is one that libertarians generally might plausibly endorse. That uh, his strength of belief in the propositions uh, that you should have on your handout are ordered stronger to weaker as number. So his belief in 3 and 3a and 4, uh, his belief in 3 and 3a and 4 and 4a are equally strong. That's why the, the 4a and 3a are numbered as they are, with the a propositions being a direct consequence of their the corresponding number of propositions and the one above it. So the argument, uh, here's how he, he writes these beliefs. One, we are sometimes morally responsible for the consequences of our actions. That's the, the belief he holds most strongly. Two, is put this way, the validity of beta, a principle that figures in his argument for incompatibilism, the validity of beta entails that our having, having free will entails indeterminism. Okay, so beta is the key transfer uh, of inability principle in his argument for incompatibilism. So basically, with Proposition 2 here, Ben Inwagen is, is saying that alpha, if you recall that argument, and the other fixity premises of the argument are more certain than beta, which comes in at 4a, saying those other parts of the argument are even more certain. Okay. Three, if one is true, if we are sometimes morally responsible for our acts, then we have free will. So free will for Van Inwagen is having the ability to act other than uh, as one does. So this proposition three is what is known as the principle of alternative possibilities. Okay, 3A, we have free will. Four, the key principle in the argument for uh, incompatibilism, beta, is valid. Um, I should note Van Inwagen now believes that beta is invalid. Um, but he accepts a successor principle that functions much the same in an argument for compatibilism. 4a, our having free will entails indeterminism. That's the thesis of incompatibilism. And finally, 5, the empirical claim, indeterminism is true. Although he prefers the proposition in that order, Ben Inwagen regards the conjunction of them as very likely. And so each of the conjuncts as individually very likely. He thus thinks it is very likely that indeterminism is true in particular, even though it comes, comes out as five on this list. But he goes on to say that if he were persuaded that science gave him an indisputable reason to accept determinism, he would reject beta for an incompatibilism for A. Since the ex hypothesi false five, that indeterminism is true, follows from 3a and 4a, and he prefers 3a to 4a, and 4a itself follows from 2 and 4, and he prefers 2 to 4. So the equally likely and linked 4 and 4a would both have to go. A is valid, and, and the thesis is incompatible. He adds crucially, and that would seem to be the end of the matter. To assess this reason, let us consider another couple uh, analogous cases. So brain and back. One, this is a hand. Two, this is a hand entails I am not a brain and a bat. Because brains and bats lack hands. So three, I am not a brain and a bat. Suppose I, 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 I accept that argument. And then I learn that three is false. I am a brain and a bat. Suppose I learn that. Okay. And then the question is what, how I should respond. Which premise of that argument, uh, how I should change my beliefs. Martian case. One, we are sometimes morally responsible for the consequences of our acts. Two, if one is true, then our acts are not all a more or less direct product of remote Martian manipulation by a secret microchip brain implants. So, our acts are not all a more or less direct product of remote Martian manipulation by a secret microchip brain implants. But I learned that that conclusion is false. Our acts are all uh, uh, such a product. Suppose that for each of these cases, 
A philosopher believes Proposition 1 more strongly than she believes Proposition 2, although she judges each of them to be very likely true. And she further believes that were she to learn not three, that the conclusion is false, she should reject two and retain one. So I learned I'm a brain in the back, but I still think this is a hand, right? I learned that all of our behavior is ubiquitously, constantly the product of uh, Martian manipulation, um, but I still continue to believe that I'm morally responsible for my acts. Now, this would not be a mystifying stance. It could be held on the basis of a not crazy theory about the role of reference in determining meaning. You might say, if we've always been brain and bats, right, uh, it might be that the meaning of this is a hand, and well, that's just what it is to have a hand. Um, it's to be in a brain and a bat and to have certain kinds of experiences or, or something like that. Uh, but I would regard it as implausible, nonetheless, that you would hold on to premise one in each case, having learned the falsity of three. In the imagined extreme circumstances, it seems more reasonable for me to abandon one rather than the conditional, expressing one of one's evident implications, that is, the conditional uh, premises two. Seems to me I ought to hang on to two and reject one, to a modus tollens, right? And so, I expect, would nearly everyone judge. Van Inwagen himself uses the Martian example against the so-called paradigm case defense of compatibilism. That indicates, though, that with respect to each case, I believe two more strongly than one. One question, then, is whether Van Inwagen can reasonably hold a different preference ordering in the original case, believing in moral responsibility more strongly than he does in the conditionals, expressing its putative theoretical implications, those conditionals being what are known as the principle of alternative possibilities, beta, and incompatibility. Note that in this case, there is nothing approaching universal agreement on these alleged implications, unlike, perhaps, the counterpart uh, conditionals in Brain and Bat and Martian. Convinced but reflective compatibilists, I'm sorry, convinced but reflective incompatibilists, such as Van Inwagen, might take this sociological difference to reflect a difference in closeness of the theoretical commitments to the pre-theoretical concept of moral responsibility and of freedom. Further, as on most questions of degree, incompatibilists will differ in their precise judgments in these matters, with some seeing a tighter connection than others. However, even if Van Inwagen reasonably assigns credences, as he indicates, it does not follow that his method for handling evidence conflicting with a strongly held belief is correct. There are options beyond continuing to believe or, con or coming to reject beliefs that underlie one's disconfirmed beliefs. So merely identifying and repudiating the least strongly held such belief that enables one to avoid outright contradiction at minimal cost would not seem to be the end of the matter. A more fine-grained response looks for probabilistic evidential connections. So if you go back to Ben and Morgan's, uh five um, premises, including the A premises, not five may not entail not three or not one, but perhaps one with Ben and Morgan's commitments should judge that three or one or both are less likely on not five than they are on current evidence, which does not include not five. We don't, I think, have current evidence, strong evidence that determinism is true. Remember that we are considering a credence set and inwagens that regards all of one through five as very likely. Van inwagen, that is, is a fully convinced, not half-hearted libertarian. If he comes to believe in determinism, he cannot rationally continue to affirm the conjunction of one through four. But since his preference for one over two three or four is slight, and scientific evidence for determinism does not speak directly to any of them, it seems most reasonable to downgrade his credence in all of them to some extent. 
He knows that at least one of them must be false, but he has no firm basis for singling out a particular one of them. Perhaps it's continuing to believe one, which he antecedently believed most strongly of the four, can survive this revision, but it will be less strongly held. There may be a reason that Van Inwagen doesn't consider this seemingly judicious stance. Note that Van Inwagen regards 3 and 3a as equally likely, and similarly for 4 and 4a. He says that he so regards these pairs of propositions because 3a follows directly from 1 and 3, and 4a follows directly from 2 and 4. But a logical implication of a pair of propositions should not be treated as equally likely as either of the individual propositions unless one regards the other of the pair as certain. To put it in probabilistic terms, just to make the point salient, if the probability of A is, say, 0.9, the probability that you assign to A is 0.9, the probability of B, a conditional, well, you were to assign the value of 0.8, and A and B entail a distinct proposition C, then C should be assigned a probability of 0.72, the product of A and B. That Inwagen's reported strengths of belief are coherent only if he assigns probability 1, or something very nearly it, to propositions 1 and 2, the more likely propositions in the deductions of 3A and 4A. Perhaps then, then Inwagen treats 1, the proposition that we are morally responsible as you might call a controlling proposition, something that we should hang on to, come what may, at least for all non-fantastical scenarios such as the Martian case. The trouble with this stance is that it comes at the price that we must completely sever our commitments, our commitment to moral responsibility from our commitment to any substantial claims regarding its empirical implications. And this simply does not sit comfortably alongside incompatibilist commitments. As we saw above in considering the first response, it does not sit easily even with many varieties of compatibilism, although their empirical exposure is more limited. Okay, my response. Belief in free will and moral responsibility are defeasibly a priori justified. A better response, I believe, pushes back more firmly against a central premise underlying the compatibilist challenge, which earlier I expressed thus. We have no business believing in advance of the science that the best final theories in physics and neuroscience will have non-deterministic dynamics. We are rationally entitled to many assumptions concerning ourselves and the causal character of reality in advance of scientific confirmation, starting with the reliability of the senses and memory and the regularity of the world's fundamental causal order. Nor is it clearly inconceivable that some of these rational and necessary assumptions might be falsified by future rational investigation. It seems conceivable, for example, that the deep regularities of our world suddenly cease to obtain being replaced by a quite different set of regularities, <clears throat> such that we come to realize that the world is partitioned into distinct eons, individuated by distinct natural laws. Okay, our bodies depend on present biological regularities, so it is challenging to see how we might survive across this transitional juncture, but it remains conceivable in 2000 it remains conceivable in 2019 that our, our bodies are not essential to us. That's all I'll say about that. Certain of our beliefs that are justified a priori thus seem to be empirically defeasible. If we characterize our belief in freedom and responsibility in this way, we need not adopt the stance of proscribing future deterministic psychological theories. Instead, we are simply betting against them while letting the chips fall where they may. If the combination of confident belief with allowing for only the barest possibility of its falsity seems improperly prejudicial, inimical to unfettered inquiry, one should be mindful of the piecemeal advance of science, especially in so complex a domain as human psychology. 
It is hard, if not impossible, to say which currently open lines of inquiry in psychology and neuroscience, if any, have the potential to lead to eventual significant disconfirmation of an incompatibilist conception. Major pieces remain to be put into place in our understanding of human psychology before such a big picture question will come squarely into view, in, uh, into the view of mature science. And even if some lines of inquiry seem friendlier to our moral self-conception than others, we may be further mindful of William James's point more than a century ago that science is often helped, not hindered, by scientists having passionate commitments to competing perspectives that they seek to vindicate through rival research programs. What then should we say concerning the hypothetical future scenario in which we come to believe that human behavior generally is, after all, psychologically determined? That the proper response would be to say, I guess we were wrong about all that, and to abandon moral practice altogether? I think not. This austere disavowal is not the sole alternative to Van Inwagen's willingness to abandon his incompatibilism. There is a more attractive and fully reasonable stance for an incompatibilist that is in the spirit of Van Inwagen's tenacity of commitment to moral responsibility. It is something like what Manuel, Manuel Vargas calls revisionism, here taken as a hypothetical response to being given compelling evidence for determinism, rather than as with Van Inwagen's current position. He's already revisionist. He already thinks we've got enough evidence to think um, our, our uh, um, unreconstructed moral uh, opinions are likely false. I don't take that to be the case. But I'm imagining, well, what happens if suppose science gave us evidence of determinists? Then I, I'm saying I would adopt something like what I'm here calling revisionism that I'm now going to explain. The basic idea is that Given evidence that our previous moral conception of human agency is unlikely or untenable, while recognizing the centrality of moral thought and action to our practical lives, we might come to think differently, whether by choice or not, about what our commitment to moral responsibility amounts to, until the changed perspective begins to take hold and wholly supplants the previous way of thinking. There is, you might say, there is our current concept of moral responsibility with its substantial empirical commitments. And there is a more general role that moral discourse plays in our practice that can be filled, if need be, by a more modest, revised concept. Being disposed to take this approach would allow one to agree with Ben and Bogan on the incompatibilist, incomplete the incompatibilist in implications of our ordinary concept, and to agree with him and many compatibilists on the practical unthinkability of abandoning the claim that we are sometimes morally responsible for the consequences of our acts in some recognizable sense, while still being open to the possibility of empirical disconfirmation of what is a substantial empirical commitment. And once we recognize the availability of this option, in a worst-case scenario, we have fully met the compatibilist challenge. Okay, so the, the, just to make it clear, the thought is, right now, if I'm an incompatibilist, I, 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 of course, believe I'm morally responsible and free in much of my actions, and I believe this entails that uh, uh, my behavior is significantly undetermined uh, on many occasions. Um, but uh, I, I recognize that's an empirical commitment. Future science could potentially disprove it. If it did, what would be my response? I think the natural response, whether we would do so by choice or not, would begin, begin to think in terms of a more modest way of thinking about the nature of moral responsibility. We would, we would in effect, undergo conceptual change. Um, and that's a potential response. So moral practice would survive, or at least um, something um, similar, something akin to present moral practice, but we would uh, have a, a lessened um, understanding of what um, that moral practice presupposes. All right, final 
comment here. Uh, I have proposed that our belief in our own freedom is epistemically warranted a priori while being defeasible, potentially disconfirmed. Whether it is wholly grounded in regular experience as of acting freely is an open empirical question, but I am inclined to doubt it. The thought that it needs to be so grounded in order to be rationally warranted is an empiricist prejudice that should be resisted. I close by briefly responding to a skeptical query. If belief in our own freedom is instinctive and warranted a priori, whence occasional disbelief in free will among the intelligentsia? The natural answer is that this is a species of theoretical skeptical doubt, similar to skeptical doubt, doubts regarding, for example, the reality of causation, another proposition that we are warranted a priori in accepting. In both cases, the theoretical doubt is matched by practical commitment to the thesis expressed in behavior. This may involve the persons having contradictory beliefs, but another possibility, and one that I find attractive, is that the person believes the target proposition, believes in causation, believes in free will, while merely, while merely believing that he disbelieves or fails to believe. That is, the theoretical doubt takes the form of a belief, a mistaken belief, concerning one of his own first-order beliefs. Either way, an advantage of the alternative conditional revisionism that I suggested a moment ago is that it would allow for continued coherence of one's practical and theoretical commitment. The man went into his father's office and told him I want to major in philosophy. He said, young man, do you know the difference between a philosophy major and a large pizza? Said, What's that? A large pizza feeds a family of four. <laughs> <laughs> Although I must say, when I went into philosophy, I made that choice, a little knowing later on, that my name, Kandun, I was named after the Tunisian and Arab philosopher historian. I found that out after I had chosen philosophy. How much of our choices are actually free? <laughs> Tim, thank you for a wonderful paper. A lot of insights here. So I have some thoughts to give, and hopefully these will be worth a lot more than the pizza. So Professor O'Connor gives us four possibilities of why our experience of freedom is a lot more than just our epistemic, subjective feeling. He tells us that it's universal and cross-cultural. The experience of free choice is the basis of our belief in freedom, not the other way around. And the experience of freedom is causally related to the process of choice itself. And finally, the experience others have of choices that we experience directly gives us warrant to believe that the experiences we have are more than just subjective. Now, the fact of the matter is most of the experiences I have of freedom, free choice, things of that nature, come from the, a subconscious neurological level, either it's physiological, chemical, presuppositional, psychological, pre-psychological, neurological. A lot of the things I believe that I'm freely choosing are actually chosen for me. Like, for example, me choosing a philosophy as my major. When I was a child, I was in well, second or third grade, they had put a sign on my desk that said I can only ask five questions an hour. <laughs> Choosing philosophy seemed to be a natural thing, but was it really me who chose it, or was it my disposition's characteristics and my deep inquiry into the deep things of life that had chosen that for me? Uh, how did I, I know that I'm the one who chose it? Well, it's complex, and that's why we get paid for this, so <laughs> this is great. But we can actually ask it at a deeper level. Now, take, for example, my liver. Its main job, I'm told, is to filter the blood coming through my digestive tract, passing it before the rest of my body. The liver 
detoxifies the chemicals, destabilizes the drugs, and in fact, it cleans out my system. I have no idea how this works, nor do I even know that it's consciously happening. But it happened. In the same way, a lot of the choices we make happen on a deep subconscious level. The trick comes in when we actually make choices consciously. Now, given our uh, interlocutors, the mechanistic, naturalistic philosophers of the day, who say that we are a byproduct of the naturalistic system that the universe has built on the physical particles that include people, such as myself, movements and choices are determined by previous movements and choices, which are determined by previous movements and choices, all the way back to the Big Bang. And in fact, everything is set. However, we still have moral responsibility. And I recognize that's a weak argument, saying that we have moral responsibility, therefore we must have free will. There is something deeper to it, of course. Take a look at some of the studies uh, Dr. O'Connor had previously was mentioned in his uh, other work. In 2002, two psychologists put a simple and brilliant idea, speculating that people's belief in freedom is actually affected by what they're told about it and how they act morally. Kathleen Voss at the University of Utah, Utah excuse me, and Jonathan Schooler at the University of Pittsburgh asked a group of participants to read a passage on free will, saying that free will is actually an illusion. They read this passage, and they noticed and they gave them some experience. They were more prone to cheat, lie, and steal after they read this passage rather than the other control group who read passages saying, no, you freely choose your dispositions and your crimes, so to speak. Our conscious choices do affect us, and we affect them. There are some good studies on this that I recommend you look into that in a deep way. Uh, I only have a few minutes, so uh, I have some short reflections here. A number of years ago, a James Fallon is a professor of economy and neurobiology at the University of California in Irvine. Fascinating gentleman. His study was studying the brains of psychopaths. Anybody know any psychopaths? Believe <laughs> that. As he studied them, something remarkable happened that changed his life. He said, as I was doing my studies of these, one of my uh, interns came into the office and showed me one of the brain scans of a, quote, normal individual, not one of the ones who are on death row or being convicted of things of that nature. He said, he began to look at the brain scan and said, there's a problem, Professor, and he said, one of these normal people is out on the street. <laughs> we need to find out who this is, because he has a similar brain scans, such as dark spots on the brain, that minimize empathy with others. And compassion. He found out after he pulled the name off the sticker of the brain scan that it was his own brain. <laughs> what James Fallon did after that is reorient and re scan his own life and the choices he's made, such as why he even married his wife, how he treats his children, why he went into the field he went into, how he treats his friends. He realized he is a psychopath at one level. And he wrote a book about it, of course, you have to write about it, called The Psychopath Inside, a neuroscientist's personal journey into the dark side of the brain. Connecting this back to Professor O'Connor's talk, how do we know that we know that we are free? On one level, we don't. On another level, we do. And the more we look into it, the more we can find out about ourselves, about our relationship to each other, about our relationship to God, and our moral responsibility. I close with what Augustine said. True freedom is not doing what you desire and want. True freedom is doing what you ought to do. Thank you. So the only thing I would want to say is in the beginning, um, I, I I was just wanted to clarify. I was trying to say um, we can make sense of the epistemic justification of our belief in our own freedom quite independent of our experience uh, of freedom. That it, it need not. I think it, it it's a partially it's an empirical. It, oddly enough, it, this epistemic question of uh, how is our 
our, our belief in our own freedom justified um, partly depends on empirical claims about how the belief arises, right? Um, whether it does, in fact, is in fact prompted, elicited if at some point as we mature uh, uh, from our own experience and then we abductively apply it to others uh, around us, or whether it's, it doesn't arise in that way. It's just simply something that it is, we are just predisposed to, to um, form uh, and when we get to a certain level of, of maturity, it just spontaneously arises. I'm inclined to think more of the latter, but it's partly it's an empirical question, so I just wanted to clarify that. Uh, there's, there's a precedent of revisionism in the history of philosophy, considering Margaret Kant. He was a determinist, first of all. He believed in moral responsibility, and he believed in moral responsibility entails freedom, and he was in the competitors too. So we have to revise the views, of course. Right. And his revision hardly convinced anybody. He assigned determinism to the phenomenal world and freedom and moral responsibility to the nominal world, world of the dignity. So I didn't really get the idea of your revisionism there. Uh. So, yeah, so the, I'm operating within a, a one world kind yeah. of uh, perspective <laughs> on things. Uh, so, so then the thought is you know, so someone says, look, what would you do if you can imagine uh, right. somehow, okay, and, and you yourself are persuaded by the evidence, and you say, okay, it seems likely that we are generally determined. Then I thought, well, there was, would, would it be just say, oh, so I guess. We're not morally responsible, we're not free, and that's that's all we just have to learn to live with this very dark conclusion. I would say, no, it's because I can I can get the hang of, of, the, of the way a compatibilist thinks about freedom and moral responsibility. I think it's wrong, right, about our actual concepts of freedom and moral responsibility. But I could begin to think in that compatibilist way to a point where I sort of my older concept of freedom and moral responsibility, the, the kind of more empirically committed, uh, sort of fades away, and I begin to have this revised notion. Right? I mean, the, the concepts undergo theoretical revision in science, yeah, for example. What is your revised notion? You have not become a compatibilist, right? No. Oh, well, no, yeah, you do become something, you yeah, become you a kind of compatibilist, right? Right, right. You, you, because you continue to believe in moral responsibility, you now accept determinism, so that entails. You, then it's going to require, at minimum, a kind of compatibility. How exactly that goes, well, you know, uh, it's it's going to be it's it, it's going to be socially shaped. Is it from you saying the same thing? Yeah. No, I don't come in compatibilities. You have to give up number two. This is number two. Right. That means. Ben in my, then in yeah, yeah, right. It's in the, that's why I said it's in the spirit of Ben in my, but Ben in my, different. Ben in my will say all along the concepts we had all along, uh, the concepts of freedom and moral responsibility were compatibilist notions. He, he, that's what he would say. Whereas I would say, no, this is an explicit change. Um, uh, the old concepts are, are shown not to have application. Um, we need successor concepts that function in similar ways. They're responsibility-like concepts, but they are different. That's the difference. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I think it's really important to discuss the free will problem also from an epistemological perspective. That's often neglected, so thank you for doing that. Um, as a libertarian, I often wondered what, what would happen if determinism were, were proved, or whether, uh, what would happen um, if it can be evaluated as very likely. And you gave us options, how could we deal with that, but you kind of neglected one option, and I wonder why you did that. And if we look at the consequence argument from the Inwagen, first premise, no one has a choice uh, about the natural law in the past, and it's necessary that the past and natural laws imply anything I do, and therefore I don't have a choice about anything I do. Now, there is the possibility of rejecting premise one. I know that sounds really absurd, a lot of people don't like that, but if we only have absurd options, and I think rejecting moral responsibility at all is an absurd option, or decoupling it from libertarian free will is 
an absurd option. Um, what about this third absurd option, rejecting the premise we don't have a choice but the past? There are some thought experiments who try to relate the phenomenological and the numerological world uh, by doing that. Yeah, you could go that way. I guess um, <laughs> it's, it's uh, <laughs> Uh, how, well, I mean, we, you'd have to, you have to flesh that out. How, how yeah, yeah, like my Bible list and all the several worlds. But there are, there are possibilities. Yeah, yeah, I, I guess I just find those less attractive. But, right. Um, but but it's maybe maybe before I give up more responsibility, I'd rather take this. But, but that's, to go back to my analogous cases, that for me is you're radically changing your conception of reality and how you relate to time because you've learned determinism is true. And it seems to me uh, an odd, you're, you're now, you know, you're now saying, okay, I used to believe that determinism was false, give that up, and now I embrace this, you know, uh, it's very speculative kind of metaphysical claim as a consequence of that. Um, yeah, that, that seems to me a more radical uh, you know, revision of my beliefs. And question that I've got to make that compatible with my scientific commitments. <laughs> Um, is it, you know, yeah. And so, so there are questions of the coherence of Kant's view, how is that, you know, that kind of broadly Kantian type of take on things. Um, I'm, I'm much less um, sympathetic to that kind of thing than we can really work out that picture in a coherent way. But yeah, that's an option. There's, so I, I take the spirit of your point. There's, there's more than one option here. There's more than two, right? The two that I've come from. I don't want to name. Sure. Yeah, I wanted to ask two questions. So the first one is a very basic one. I've never understood what the question of physical determinism and indeterminism has to do with free will anyway. So um, perhaps just just we, so if I'm reductionist about reality, then if I get physical indeterminism, I don't get free will anyway because this uh, indeterminism isn't free action. And if I'm non-reductionist, then the physical, the basic physical theory can be deterministic. And a kind of free will. So why do we discuss this question of Good. physical determinism, indeterminism when we speak about free will? Good. Yeah, I could only do so much in the talk, and I fear I was giving you a lot of nitty gritty detail at certain points already. Um, right, but uh, it could well be. I, I agree with you that it could well be that um, we could imagine physical theorists thinking that the best theory they have of basic physical dynamics at a small scale um, is deterministic, has a kind of deterministic um, dynamic to it. And you say, but uh, now you need sort of philosophical assumptions to then draw the implication that my behavior is fully determined. I mean, one, one might be that I'm only physically reposed, that there are no uh, irreducibly tumbled down um, forms of causation, even within the physical domain, like that is no, no form of strong emergence, right? You need, you need extra assumptions beyond, right? And, all, and these are assumptions many people want to make, but as you say, if you're making those assumptions, you probably have other reasons to be skeptical about free will, even if physics is indeterministic. It's all bottom driven by bottom up. Um, correct, uh, I agree with you on that. Uh, I think neuroscience would be a better Candidate science that could cause me to have memories about freedom, but uh, it's and I'm. I, I mean, I was talking at breakfast with someone about this. I think we're so far away from having a credible threat to belief in our own freedom, even from neuroscience, because it's so underdeveloped at this point in terms of uh, yeah. But but that you know because my belief in freedom has implications for neural dynamics, if I believe that. Brain is at least bound up with my thinking and deliberating and choosing, however, we think about the mind exactly. Uh, it's going to have implications for correct um, dynamics wherever choice is located in the brain, which, by the way, we don't even know exactly uh, at this stage of games, let alone being able to test specific hypotheses. So, I, I, I think neuroscience would be the better kind of science um, to focus on. Well, there's so much to talk about here, and I don't want to derail things, so I'm, I'll say one thing briefly that we can discuss outside. Your probabilistic analysis toward the end, uh, I think, needs to be finessed yep. a bit. Uh, you, you're, the point you're trying to make may still stand, but there are some technical issues regarding entailment and probability that we should discuss. Um, 
I was reflecting as we were talking on a couple of dilemmas that have been put forward that might point to a disanalogy between the uh, brain and vet case and certain kinds of, like the Martian case or other things. Uh, one of them is this. There's a, a book that was published more than a century ago by Arthur James Balfour uh, called Foundations of Belief. He puts forward an argument regarding a number of different aspects of our experience, reason and free freedom being among them, that if the account you give of the origin of a thing is wholly, makes it wholly impossible that that thing should have the value you place upon it, then you have a problem. And I, I wonder about the entanglement of this with issues of freedom, and particularly uh, freedom of choice of beliefs, which might be a species of action depending upon how one parses these things. Uh, if you are wholly determined to believe that determinism of some sort, whether it be the evolution of the wave equation or whatever, is true, then this may raise some very serious epistemic worries about your warrant for your own beliefs, including that belief. Um, that is, but whether it does or not, it, it may also raise worries about the value of your beliefs, the value that they have been inclined to think there's something wonderful and beautiful about the rationality of at least some of our beliefs, and so then that becomes problematic. Right. Richard wants to yes. chime in. Yes. Uh, on the contrary, I think the argument goes the other way. That is to say, if I had complete freedom of choice of my beliefs, there would be a problem, because um, uh, I would know that what I believe was up to me, it wasn't in any way influenced by how things are. And if I thought that, I couldn't really believe it. Uh, I believe something because I believe my influence, my belief is influenced by how things are. And it seems to be the causation of our beliefs is what guarantees uh, sufficient but necessary for our rationality. And I didn't say complete freedom though. So that, I, I think you're taking that in a stronger sense than I was attempting it. Well, to the extent to which it's up to us, to that extent, uh, <laughs> we are, uh, uh, I have no warrant for believing it. Okay, let's... Yeah. <laughs> 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 you weren't talking about that. You were talking about our choice of action, not our choice of belief. Yes, but he's he's applying it to the domain of belief. You're, you're, but, uh, am I misunderstanding yeah, that? I, I, yeah. I worry about its application there, yes. Yeah. I'm... Uh, you know, this is a... There's a, there's a lot of discussion of this issue, and the arguments always seem a little bit obscure. Um, but um, so I mean, the basic worry is, yeah, all my beliefs are are de fully causally determined. Then you know my belief in determinism is determined ultimately by you know impersonal factors, quite apart from the fact of. I mean, it's a little tricky theoretical beliefs. I I, I, I can feel the worry. When, when one thinks of, of that not only are all of our beliefs and actions determined, but we, we endorse some kind of strongly reductionistic view, right? Because then the thought is that, look, the ultimate drivers of all the beliefs as well as actions um, aren't even psychologically salient kinds of factors. They're just subatomic physical factors that are, have, that, that, yeah. Uh, and then um, I can see the word there, but that's a, that, that seems to me a, an additional substantial um, commitment. That way is, is, so I think you're right, a reductionistic deterministic physicalism is problem, is trouble. Uh, epistemically, it may not be a stable kind of position to hold, um, but that just means that you can't find that conjunction. But determinism itself, I don't see, is really the root of the problem. This is going back to Lee's point. Rather than the reductionism is a, is a problem all by itself. You mentioned several other times that it might be up to physics to tell us eventually whether determinism is true or not. I would like to argue that physics, being in principle, can never mm -hmm. tell us whether determinism is true. And imagine our ultimate theory was indeed a set of deterministic equations. And determinism would be a property of mathematical equations. 
Coming to the conclusion that nature has said is deterministic is always a metaphysical step. And the determinism of the equations can never ever be tested empirically by physics, because physics has to do with things we can measure and calculate. And we can always measure only with limited precision. We can calculate with a finite number of digits only, because computers are finite machines that have a finite number of bits. But deterministic equations, claiming that deterministic means claiming there is infinite precision. It has to do with real numbers and mathematical objects, not physical objects. So physics can never ever demonstrate a synchronism. Okay. Um, two, two things about that. One is it would be a problem enough for an incompatibilist such as myself uh, if it's not strictly determinism being made very likely, something approximating, closely approximating determinism. So if I'm if I'm told I've got good good evidence and I'm told whether the, the, the antecedent of this conditional is true, I'm going to address in a second. But if I came to believe that um, there was good empirical evidence that at least my behavior is very nearly determined, that there's a very high objective probability, antecedent probability to every action, every choice that I ever make, as in 0.99, you know, something. That, 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 that near enough to determinism would be, that I would think would call into question uh, our commitments to freedom and moral responsibility. So the, 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 the lack of, you know, you might say infinite precision is not going to um, enough is not enough to take away um, the, the potential threat. But maybe you also agree that it's one thing for how how are physical theories, you know, basic particle dynamic theories um, confirmed? Well, they're they're confirmed by isolating very small scale systems like in thick lead chambers, near vacuum conditions, seeing how these particles behave, theorizing, applying the theoretical apparatus and dynamic, right? And seeing if the dynamical equations um, that have been developed uh, pretty closely approximate or perfectly approximate um, what we observe, right? But that doesn't tell us that in large scale, massively complex organized systems, such as the human body, uh, um, that that everything is just is just small scale dynamics writ large, right? Just just multiplied, uh, aggregated, you know, unfa in, in unfathomably complex ways, right? Maybe at certain um, levels of organized complexity, certain top down factors kick in, right? That particle physics knows nothing about, right? That's physics is, has to be silent on, on that question, right? Whether, whether anything like that is true, basic physics, it just doesn't speak to that because we can't we can't apply quantum mechanics to a living human brain and, and monitor the, the hundreds of billions, trillions of variables in quantum mechanical terms that bear on the evolution of a human brain, even over a you know two second time span in and around the uh, of the behavior of that image. That's just a fantasy. We never will be able to do anything like that. Right? So that's why I, it's going back to the early part. It's not physics that's going to fundamentally settle this way. It's more high level psychological neuroscientific theories that seem to approximate determinism. That if we could imagine you know, your brain being monitored in a sophisticated way while you were making a morally significant choice, and they're being able to somehow tell in advance without telling you because that would affect what you would do, right? But be able to predict with a very high level of accuracy the choices that you were making, that would, would be worse. I think that too is a far, far off possibility, if ever, right? But that's at least a conceivable scenario we can imagine. Uh, my question would be some kind of follow up. Um, if uh, our uh, propositional attitudes, uh, thoughts, beliefs, and desires are not determined, and it's only our actions that are determined, then how are the beliefs and actions going to co co collaborate with one another? Because um, I, I think that the, the objection that was raised needs to be met somehow. Otherwise, um, it wouldn't. I don't. I don't understand how it makes sense to say. That Beliefs are not determined, the psychological state is not determined, so my thought that I'm determined is not predetermined. But on the other hand, I can speak meaningfully about my actions being determined. 
Okay. Uh, no, um, I, I don't think that was what the, the suggestion. The suggestion is not that he's it's related. Yeah. yeah okay. Related. Okay. Yeah. So I. I mean. I guess I'm with Richard here that I would think that my beliefs typically, at least typically, are determined by various psychological my my evidence my the evidence of which I'm aware and the unconscious influences on my beliefs. I don't make choices typically about what to believe. I just do. I find myself believing certain things. There, there, there is some kind of psychological process that presumably is, if not strictly deterministic, quasi-deterministic, that results in my belief. That's what I want to say about belief. I don't think I... I yeah, there, there might be special types of belief, right, where we think the evidence is uncertain and involves moral commitment, you know, practical commitment, these kinds of... Those are special cases, and we might think differently about those. But in terms of, you know, just do I believe there are bushes outside the window, right? I didn't choose to believe that. I, I have certain experiences and I hope I believe it. And I'm not sure, I, I assume that was quasi determined. There's no choice at all um, about it. Uh, but my behavior, um, I want to say, is influenced by my beliefs and desires, certainly. I'm prepared to say there are objective probabilities uh, of what I would do. Uh, on any, what I will do on any given occasion, uh, associated with certain desires, long-standing goals, intentions I have, are going to make certain actions far more likely for me than other actions. Um, Richard, I think, is going to talk about the role of motivation, um, going for objective probabilities to human choices, um, but I'm happy to say that. Um, so so I, I, I think there can be causal influence that's not deterministic. So just to, the last part is like your belief that you are not determined. What is that? Is that something you've chosen to believe in, or is that? No, I don't think so. Okay, I, I just find myself believing that. Great. Yeah. Dr. Robbins. Yeah. Um, my, my question actually again related to the question of the moon. I mean, it's, it's a very old, long-standing uh, tradition in the industry of the main sort of argument, the main sort of the purest meaning. Um, so I'll respond to your response since my original question was already taken. Um, it couldn't be related to the engineers and that it, it's not about the, the, the physical world, but that what the, the, the argument is exposing is that truth as a standard for belief transcends for metaphysical reasons any kind of mechanical physical process that could determine our beliefs and therefore rely on or have to rely on the transcendence of truth vis-a-vis -vis the physical system to, to, to make the argument uh, work. Um, I, I'm tempted to say yes. I'm not fully sure that I'm tracking with what you're saying. Um, so suppose I say yes. <laughs> <laughs> Just maybe if, if I heard you say more, I think that would help me. <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, there is a question. Um, I, I should I should advertise. There's a very good book that just came out a year ago by Foster Rowe and Blocky, and I'm, I'm embarrassed I'm forgetting the title of the book. Um, uh, but uh, trans, trans, there's transcendental arguments for freedom. He's revisiting these ancient, uh, uh, and it's a it's a very careful. Um, linking of contemporary epistemology back to this kind of ancient issue. And he, he is right. He's sympathetic to uh, what Tim was suggesting, that we really can't believe in a universal determinism and believe that our beliefs are epistemically justified, at least in any in, in a certain kind of internalist conception of epistemic justification. It's a great book. I think it's kind of state of the art. It's a story of the art. So let me just end with an advertisement. Thank you.